Because the reality that a directive on litigation from a minister was even needed speaks volumes to the much more foundational challenges we still face. Tonight, Jody Wilson-Raybould speaks to the Directive on Indigenous Litigation she issued just before being shuffled out as Attorney General. It would be nice if this federal government that's so committed to reconciliation, and I say that in quotes, would actually put some muscle behind that. A Senate committee is traveling to hear how changes to approving pipelines will impact Indigenous rights. At this rate, by 2051, only 4% of us will be using Inuktut at home. And Indigenous peoples share their realities with world leaders at the United Nations in New York City. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. Former Attorney General and Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould was a keynote speaker today at the First Nations Provincial Justice Forum held on Musqueam Territory in B.C. She shared some of her thoughts before the audience in an address called From Denial to Recognition, the Challenges of Indigenous Justice in Canada. Her talk was peppered with references to the SNC-Lavalin affair Here's some of what Wilson Raybould had to say. Because the reality that a directive on litigation from a minister was even needed speaks volumes to the much more foundational challenges we still face. The patterns of perpetual, expensive, and seemingly endless litigation that have fallen, that we've fallen into is a symptom of a much deeper dilemma rooted in the history of our country and about how the law and the justice system has operated. Indeed, all of these terms, justice system, rule of law, administration of justice and others, have meant simply or something starkly different for Indigenous peoples than other Canadians. And it is that difference that fundamental fact that Canada's justice system has historically had a role in perpetuating injustice for Indigenous peoples that we are all working so urgently to confront and change. And we'll have more from Jody Wilson-Raybould on tomorrow's newscast. The Senate Committee on Energy, the Environment and Natural Resources was in Halifax today for public hearings on Bill C-69. It's the proposed federal law that, if passed, will change how energy projects and pipelines are approved and regulated. The new bill would assess environmental health, social and economic impacts of projects, but the main topic at the hearings today was the proposed increase in Indigenous input and consultation. Two senators agreed the government has much work to do on that front. Uh, and so therefore we have to have a meaningful conversation and a meaningful consultation, not just one side, but at the dialogue. And also because they want to be uh, equity partners, they want to be part of this uh, development and, and not just ob uh, observers. And it would be nice if this federal government that's so committed to reconciliation, and I say that in quotes, would actually put some muscle behind that and say, we're going to do the environmental assessment to ensure that the Aboriginal people and the fishers are not once again held hostage to a company that's looking out to make profits. In the shadow of Earth Day this past weekend, residents in Whitehorse were being warned their own landfill will be full by 2043 if people don't stop using plastic bags immediately. Three bales of bags were on show during an awareness campaign for the overuse of plastic shopping bags. Each bale weighs a third of a ton. And they're on display at a few locations in Whitehorse to remind you, Connors, that collectively they produce 21 bales of this stuff each day. Plastic bags don't break down over time. Organizers say filling the dump with plastic bags like this is no longer an option. And the responsibility is on the consumer to do their part to divert this plastic waste. You can use your wallet uh, as a way to vote. So if you see a store that is banning bags altogether, says, sorry, we don't pr uh, provide those bags, go shop there. That's excellent. We want to support those businesses that are getting out of bags altogether. 
BC's health officer is pleading for the provincial government to decriminalize illegal street drugs to curb the opioid epidemic. Dr. Bonnie Henry says she's not asking for legalization, but instead for an alternative to criminal charges for drug users. In a new report entitled Stopping the Harm, Henry says the current laws shame users and stops them from seeking treatment. Henry says decriminalization would allow police to help with those living with addiction. Calmer winds are in the forecast for the town of Bigger Saskatchewan. And that could be the break crews battling an out-of-control wildfire and residents have been waiting for. I mean, you can smell it now, but it, it can get worse fast. It's, yeah, it's pretty hard on the lungs, especially when you get older. A state of emergency was declared by the town on Tuesday, a day after the fire was declared out of control. Dozens of patients have also been moved from the local hospital because of smoke. Fire crews and farmers are trying to move cattle away from pasture land threatened by the flames. To another natural disaster, every spring communities near lakes and rivers across the country worry about spring flooding. Homes are ruined and people are forced to evacuate. But for some indigenous communities, evacuation is a yearly event and people don't get to return to their home territory for years oftentimes. On today's edition of In Focus, we looked at the devastating effects that flooding has had on two First Nations in particular, including one that saw community members scattered in hotels and apartments hundreds of miles from each other and home for seven or more years. It has a lot of emotional impact. Yeah. And all the stress you go through and not feel that feeling of being in your own home is not the same when you have to stay somewhere else. Mm -hmm. How long were you gone for? I was gone for over six years. I just recently went back uh, November 2017. To me, it really traumatized me emotionally because uh, this is the second time in my life that, uh, you know, being taken off reserve, like really? when I was a little girl and I went to residential school. So this was just like residential school? Yeah, okay. right back again, you know, the memories, the flashing, you know, and it yeah. was horrible. So it took me until about, uh, it took me a, until about June 14th when I actually moved and uh, the, the high waters really came and uh, the uh, water was uh, hitting the Jeep uh, mm. wheel wells. Yeah. I finally got out then and I told my dog, I said, chill, it's time to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've been trying to do in the past uh, few years uh, to bring our community together and uh, uh, to bring people together uh, is to hold events such as the Treaty Day events that we hold and uh, we also hold the uh, fishing derbies. Uh, we, we, we're creative in how to bring people together. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, supply meals uh, in the community, have a barbecue. Yeah. Uh, we also held uh, uh, me meals here in Winnipeg which Muriel spearheaded before mm -hmm. a meal that Red Cross paid for. And uh, things like that that uh, bring people to get together uh, mm -hmm. is a way to go and uh, hopefully uh, not resolve all the issues, but also to bring people together. Yeah. You can watch the entire episode on flooding by visiting our website, aptnnews.ca, and catch the replay of today's show tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Well, as you may have noticed, many Indigenous leaders, both political and grassroots, we're at the United Nations in New York City this week. We'll hear from a few of them after the break. Starting on the East Coast, plus six for Halifax. Snow and two above in Charlottetown. Three above under sunny skies for Nain. Plus four for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Twelve in Montreal. Eight in Quebec City. Snow for Saguenay. 17 under sunny skies in London, Toronto, and Peterborough. 16 in Ottawa. 9 above with showers in Wawa. 17 for Thunder Bay. Plus 3 in Thompson and Puckettawagon where snow is expected. 13 above in Winnipeg. 12 and showers for Gimli. 10 in Regina and Saskatoon. Sunny and 9 for North Battleford. Nine with a chance of snow for Meadow Lake, plus five in showers in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. 
Right now, the United Nations is hosting the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and two well-known Nunavut Inuit women addressed delegates yesterday. The subject was traditional knowledge, and delegates heard from both uh, Nunavut Tungavut President Aluki Kuterik and Inuit singer-songwriter Kelly Fraser. Both stressed how using Indigenous language can help Indigenous kids live better lives. Here's some of what they had to say. Inuktut is declining at 1% per year. At this rate, by 2051, only 4% of us will be using Inuktut at home. Together we can save the world. I, my friend killed himself yesterday, and I believe that if we uh, make Inuktitut official in our country, we would save more people. Hundreds of Indigenous peoples from around the world are there to take part in the two-week summit, including a delegation of Quebec First Nations who are asking the UN to intervene when it comes to police discrimination. Joining us now with more is Grand Chief Verna Polson of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation Tribal Council. Grand Chief Polson, thanks for speaking with us here. You and other Indigenous leaders are asking the United Nations to undertake a specific review of police discrimination against Indigenous women. What is a specific review and what are you looking to accomplish? Well, I'm in here today in New York to make sure that the, the whole world knows what's taking place in our community, in our nation, as uh, Indigenous people who are facing discrimination throughout our territory. So we are bringing it to the national level, international level, may I say, um, to, to make sure the stories are heard and, and that our people needs to get this justice and that discrimination is here in 2019, fully alive, and that we need to continue addressing this until our people get the justice they deserve. Uh, Grand Chief, for our viewers who aren't familiar with the Quebec region, can you explain why this issue of police discrimination is so important to the Algonquin nations you represent? Oh, it's very, it's very important to every nation who has to face discrimination throughout their life, throughout their nation, throughout their community. You know, it happens everywhere, not only in our community, in our nation, mm -hmm. in our district, you know. And it's very important that we must find a solution. How can we work together? How can we resolve this together as, as peoples of, of this land? Not only for the First Nation, but how can we get how can we get the non-indigenous people understand us as people of, of many of our territories throughout not only Quebec, but Canada and whole. So for me to be here today in, and to address this, you know, this issue that's taking place, it's very important that this needs to be brought to a higher level. Quebec is, is I, I, I don't, Quebec is trying their best as well, but not as fast enough, not fast enough for us to get justice for our people. So this is why I'm here today with many other uh, um, colleagues of mine of Quebec, you know, and, and we, we're trying to send that clear message, enough's enough, we want justice for our people, just like anyone else. Grand Chief, there's an event tonight you're taking part in. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, um, we have our regional chief here, uh, Justin Picard from the AFNQL, Family of First Nation, Quebec and Labrador. Uh, we have um, Chief of Leximo, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> edit it. Okay. Uh, chief Jerome from Leximo, who is here as well, and we're going to um, address the people who are going to be intervening in the session side, side event that's going to be taking place here that we also face the same thing across Canada who's facing discrimination against our people we are here to address it we are here to share our stories our trauma what our people are going through on a daily basis so this is why I'm here you know it is to help 
not only our nation, but also to address everyone else's uh, discrimination they face on a daily basis. It's uh, really something to see everybody down there at the UN. Uh, Grand Chief, we appreciate you uh, taking some time to join us here today. I thank you for having me, and I hope I answered all your questions. The multi-million dollar Indian Day School settlement has an upcoming day in court. Details on that after the break. But first, the look at the rest of Thursday's weather forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, 10 under sunny skies for Grand Prairie, 9 and sunny for Peace River, 14 in Medicine Hat, 10 in Red Deer and Edmonton. Showers for Vancouver and Tofino with a high of 14, 18 in Kamloops. Plus 9 under sunny skies for Fort Nelson, Smithers and Prince George. Minus 1 in Old Crow, 5 above for Mayo and Whitehorse. Plus 8 in Fort Liard and Trout Lake. Minus 2 with snow for Yellowknife. 10 below in Saks Harbor. Minus 9 with snow in Holotuck. 15 below for Chesterfield. Minus 18 in Repulse Bay. Minus 17 in Arctic Bay. 21 below with snow for Resolute. Welcome back. A court hearing is coming up for the multi-million dollar Indian Day School settlement. As many as 120,000 people who attended the schools are eligible for between $10,000 and $200,000. So does that mean compensation checks will soon be in the mail? Our online reporter Kathleen Martins is here to tell us more. Kathleen, thanks for joining us. This is a story you've been working on for quite a while now. Where are things at? Uh, well, Dennis, a uh, court hearing, federal court in Winnipeg, set for next month. Everybody's looking forward to that. It's called a certification hearing. And I understand it's uh, not smooth sailing, though. Uh, why is that? That's right. There's always uh, some drama attached to these kinds of things. And uh, there's a group that uh, has uh, obtained what we call intervener status. That means they can address the judge and bring points to the judge's attention that they feel have been left out or need to be improved in the agreement. And what would some of those improvements be? Well, they really want to see something like the uh, individual hearings, the independent assessment process hearings under the residential school settlement. Those were hearings where survivors went into uh, a private meeting with lawyers and uh, talked about abuse that they suffered at school. So the, there's a, sort of a group of opponents that feel that day school survivors should have that same opportunity. And so where does that leave this process? Well, it, uh, you know, it's, you've got the people that are pushing for it and then you've got now a group that are kind of pushing against it and it could stall or delay it and that means more of the survivors could pass away. We're dealing with uh, quite an older group of uh, day school students um, and already even the lead plaintiff, Gary McLean, who started this whole settlement back in 2009, uh, he died in February. Well, and as this thing is uh, tied up in courts, I guess, what does that mean for those who are you know, looking for this compensation? Well, they're just going to have to wait a little bit longer as these groups uh, will have the judge's ear, as we said, in May. And then uh, I think the judge is aware that, you know, there is some urgency to try to get this thing settled. It's been dragging on since 2009. And uh, hopefully the judge will make a determination maybe even in 30 days. So perhaps by June there could be a decision. And then from then then that period there'll be another year of which you can apply for compensation and then obtain it. So um, hopefully people won't have to wait too much longer. Well, Kathleen, appreciate you uh, continuing to follow this story and bringing us up to date here. No problem. Thanks, Dennis. Schools in the Northwest Territories are governed by a Southern curriculum and all too often kids are graded through Alberta achievement tests. But one school in the Klichau region says that students and schools face unique challenges unknown to provincial classrooms. Our Charlotte Moore Jacobs has that story. 
Patsy Wittratti's passion for school surpasses her remarkable reading abilities. I like everything about school. I like math. I like my English, my social studies. I like basically every class that I go to, I like it. Because it's making me more, it makes me feel like I'm more learning things, more information I never knew. She is picking out some new novels from a Books and Homes program put on by De Beers, a major mining company in the Northwest Territories. The fair is aimed at improving literacy rates in 11 schools. Something needed because in 2017, only 8 to 27 percent of students met the Alberta standard for math and English. Lindsay Nitsiza, the school librarian, says it can be challenging to get kids to read. There is more advanced readers and then there's some of the kids where they're just, they read on their own and they don't read out loud because the way it sounds to other kids. Like, they do tease them, and I do get that a lot here in the library, and I just... Josh Linklitter, the principal at Mezzi Community School, thinks standardized tests aren't really helping, and that they consistently paint a grim picture of NWT students. We, we do the testing, because uh, we, we have to, um, and it, it does provide valuable data. Uh, like, it's not a waste of time. It does provide us a v valuable information that we can use to improve, and. I don't think it's necessarily fair to expect them to, to perform the same way or to compare them to the standards in Alberta because they're not, they're not the same students and they're, the students there, they wouldn't be necessarily successful up here or, or vice versa. Um. Improving reading extends beyond the walls of the school. Like we had one student that he'd come in every day and he'd be so tired and we finally we asked him, like, why are you so tired? So well, I don't have an alarm clock. I'm staying up all night so I can so I won't miss school. Um, so sometimes it's as simple as that. We just need to provide them with a, a watch or an alarm clock so that they can set an alarm and get up on time and come to school. Uh, Bringing books into remote communities in the north is important. Sometimes it can even inspire students to make reading a lifelong career. I want to do in a group is my favorite thing. Read books and Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN <laughs> National <laughs> News, Wati. If you'd like to let us know how you feel about that story or any others, here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca, find us online at aptnnews.ca, and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. Well, that is your APTN National News for this Wednesday. And you can find news anytime at our website, aptnnews.ca. That's also where you can find today's episode of In Focus, where flooding on First Nations was our topic. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a fantastic night. And I'm Dennis Ward. Have a good night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.